Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome to this evening's Board of Education meeting being held in the Town Hall Chambers. The date is Tuesday, January 14th, 2020. I appreciate it if everyone turns off their cell phones or other electronic devices as this is being recorded. Ellen, could you please do the roll call? Thank you, Chairperson Carey, and good evening, everyone, and happy 2020. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Evans? Mrs. Granado? Present. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Mr. Riley? Here. Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Present. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative, Mr. Isaac Santos? All present. All right, would we please stand? And would the Weathersfield Humanities students in the back start the pledge for us? Thank you. Ms. Sermit, student and staff recognition. We have none this evening, Mr. Carey. Thank you. All right, approval of previous minutes. Can I have a <coughs> approval of December 10th, 2019, regular ed Board of Education meeting? Uh, uh, motion to approve. Can I get a second? Second. second. Oh, go ahead. Any comments or changes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes, thank you. All right, public comment, if you could please come up to the podium, state your name and address. Anyone who wishes to make public comment. Seeing no public comment, we will move on to communications. Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Good evening, everyone, and a happy 2020. Uh, a couple of items this evening, just to uh, let everyone know, we will have our first uh, budget workshop coming up this Saturday. Uh, the 18th of January from 9 a.m. to noon in the lower level conference room of the Stillman building. So again, that's uh, January 18th, this Saturday from 9 until noon. Uh, the weather forecast looks like the snow will hold off until early afternoon. So we have the expectation that we're gonna be able to get this one in. Unlike the last one that we had to cancel for weather. Um, the agenda this evening is full with a variety of different presentations. Um, tonight you're going to see a couple of presentations on school improvement plans. And you're also going to be treated to a presentation on the portrait of a graduate, which is part of our NEASC work that we're um, deeply involved with already in advance of an upcoming NEASC accreditation visit. And we'll have the first read of the proposed graduation requirement changes as mandated by the wonderful state of Connecticut. So we have a full uh, slate this evening. And with that, that's communications. Thank you, sir. There is no action items tonight, so moving on to the reports and discussions, the vision of the graduate presentation, Mr. Emmett. Yes, very proud to uh, have some of our teacher leaders coming up with us this evening, Ms. Kristen Musinskis and Ms. Shannon Belanger, who will talk with us about the process of the portrait of a graduate. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Belanger, and I teach Algebra II honors and geometry at the high school. I'm also the senior class advisor, and I coach math team, and I am the co-accreditation coordinator with Kristen. Um, I'm Kristen Musinskis. I teach um, 9th, 10th, and 12th grade English at the high school. I'm also co-accreditation <laughs> coordinator with Shannon. Um, in addition, I am the Early College Experience UConn site rep. Right, and so tonight we're here to inform you of the current status of our um, Vision of the Graduate Development. The Vision of the Graduate is tied to one-third of the new standards for the accreditation process. Um, and to be honest, it's from our staff and from everyone who's been really working on this, it's been very refreshing um, to have the autonomy, to have teacher-led work on this, and to be able to um, really create this new critical component from within. I think we've had a lot of teacher buy-in so far, which has been great. Um, so we're really looking to start the gathering the feedback process on the work we've done thus far. And we've started collaborating with the middle school. All right, so mark your calendars. Um, our collaborative conference team will be visiting Weathersfield High School on May 4th and 5th. And as part of their visit, they will be observing classrooms, meeting with students, um, meeting with parents and teachers, central office administrators, meeting with building administrators, with our department liaisons, 
and then meeting with support staff who includes the nurses, school counselors, librarian, and special education teachers. Um, during this time, they'll be discussing self-reflection um, that we've done and then the self-reflection with the steering committees as well. Um, the visit that they're coming for is a two-day visit. It's a quick snapshot of Weathersfield High School that also includes the report writing and the scoring of both our foundational elements and the principles of effective practice for the new standards for accreditation. This is a short visit. The longer visit will be in two years. That's a four to five day visit. Um, WHS is scheduled to have that full decennial in the spring of 2022. All right, so the vision of the graduate. Um, it's a holistic view of expectations for students, including transferable skills, context, understandings, and disposition. And so NIAC has really gone out and really thought about, well, what does this really mean? So transferable skills are the essential skills students need to be able to confront new challenges, both in and outside of the school. Transferable skills include creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. Um, dispositions are patterns of behavior and thinking necessary for future success, both in and outside of school. Knowledge includes the topics, information, and facts that are essential for students to be able to recall or access. And understandings are the ability to marshal skills and facts widely and appropriately through effective application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So it's really taking an extension of our current core values and beliefs, right? Those are beliefs, we really like own them as a district, we own them as teachers, um, as administration, as board of ed members, and now transferring that into something that is a Skill, right? How can we assess the skills? Are our kids really ready to graduate um, and move on? And then where are they in that path? And how can we help them to be more successful when they do leave others for high school? So within that vision and those ideas of um, holding kids accountable to it, there's the idea of holonomy. And that's the concept that addresses the interconnectedness of each layer of our educational system. So that'd be the leadership, the school system, the school culture, the teachers and the students, and that we all exhibit um, similar values and skills. Think about the skills that each group requires for productive educational experience that we can transfer to and teach our students. So this skill should be reflective of college, career, and life readiness. Skills should also be those which our leadership, board of education, school system, school culture, teachers, and students should exhibit. We're trying to make Weathersfield High School and Weathersfield the best Weathersfield it can be. So the question for us would be, what skills does each layer have that we transfer to other groups that both surround us and form our base? So big reveal. Um, <laughs> so we think of our idea as an onion with the student as the core of our Weathersfield onion, um, and that's displayed prominently already throughout town. It's a clear vision for our vision of our graduate. Um, as members of the most ancient town, students have connectedness to their roots. Those would be the stakeholders, parents, teachers, community members, board of education members, anybody else that they interact with, um, there's a wide list. And if they are the center of our onion, then all of those transferable skills, knowledge, understandings, and dispositions would be expected of them. We should also be willing and able to demonstrate them ourselves. All right, so um, while we were collaborating with the middle school in, in December, someone said, was it you, Cindy Flores? Own your onion? Yeah, own your onion. So how do we get kids <laughs> to own our onion? So um, Kristen, Matt Mangino, Teriyasco, and I, we went to the NIAS um, professional development, it was the first week in October, um, and we really learned about what are they looking for when they're assessing um, where a school district is in developing their vision of the graduate, and then how are they assessing and implementing um, those skills, and, and how is it gonna be evaluated for us when the accreditation actually happens. Um, so while we were there, we sent a two question survey to our staff, and I want you to think about this, like what you would say. Um, what skills should a graduate have to be successful beyond high school? And what do you think our WHS graduates should be able to do? And if you think about um, what skills have you used in the last two hours, right? Communication, you had to collaborate, you had to problem solve who's making dinner, right? Um, so some of those skills, they were um, pretty common throughout. And if we were to take a look at the skills that are identified by NIAS with those definitions about um, you know, transferable skills, knowledge, disposition, and content, along with our current strategic plan, our current high school um, core values and belief statements, and the results from our staff survey, we're all saying the same thing. Um, so in November, we worked on professional development in our high school, um, at the high school level for, um, what did we do? Oh, we worked on developing- The skills. <laughs> the skills, yeah. the skills <laughs> and then thinking initially about how we're gonna assess this. All right, and we're really all saying the same thing. So, the skills that we have currently. 
um, our citizen, right? So how do we perform our civic duty? We have some seniors from Mother's Hill study. They're performing their civic duty by observing tonight's Board of Ed meeting. Um, how do we communicate effectively um, with and without like oral, um, you know, visual, right? How are we collaborating? How are we gonna collaborate as a team um, to get our goal ac accomplished? How are we a problem solver? Um, and then personal wellness and life and career skills. So we, at the high school level, also had a knowledge component. We really thought that that went um, kind of interwoven with all of six of these. So we've kind of gotten rid of it as a subcategory and have put it um, within the indicators to each of these six. So our collaborative journey um, began in December with the middle school who had started working on this a couple of years ago. What did they want for their vision of a stylish new middle school graduate? Um, so we can really create a unified 712 vision, have common language, have common expectations. Um, this past week, our January PD, we spent two hours really kind of thinking about what are the indicators for these six skills. Um, and so we're really starting the feedback process. We had a parent focus group last night. Um, they gave us some initial feedback about perhaps um, condensing personal wellness and life and career skills. Um, we had talked about maybe there's really only four skills instead of six. Um, so it's really everything is flexible, everything is out in the open, but this is where we're at so far. <coughs> so um, to go back to the January 8th PD focus, um, that this past Wednesday we met with Silas Dean Middle School teachers and collaborated on their initial vision um, and looked at it as far as the continuum of where do we see these skills. So we figured that there were two groups for each skills and this is also flexible. Um, and that the seventh and eighth grade would be responsible for um, more of a, a student and parent friendly version of what the identified visions of the graduate skills and um, assessments would be. And then the question right now is do we keep it as 9-10 or do we go to an 11, that and 11-12 or do we just have 9 through 12 be um, kind of a continuum there. This initial work included some drafted outcomes, a lot of ICANN statements, um, we're pretty much, we have a draft, it's, we're gonna go back to it. It's and draft. hopefully to go back to it in February and continue the conversation. Um, I just wanna reiterate, the work is not done, this is an ongoing process. Once we do move past the initial vision of the graduate, it should drive some assessment rubrics that we'll be using as school-wide focus, um, and should really become part of the language and part of the skill base that we use when we teach our students. Um, the February afternoon PD Wait, session, question, yeah, go ahead. What is citizen vertical articulation mean? Oh, so oh, the sorry. category was citizen, and then we had the vertical articulation for seven through 12. So that was like the language we were using was we were vertically aligning um, because our PD was with both the middle school and the high school staff. So it was I'm really just the, citizen. So the language, the common language you use through those grades is, mm -hmm. is articulation. So like yeah, collaborator, the yeah, the citizen um, category would be the skill base, but the skills required of a seventh and eighth grader might not be the same as you would require of a ninth, tenth, or an eleventh, twelfth grader. So okay. that vertical articulation would be what does it look like for seventh and eighth grader versus a ninth, tenth grader, an eleventh, twelfth grader. Certainly, a seventh and eighth grader is not going out and voting, um, but they might have no, some kind I, of I a vote like within their classroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. So hopefully in February, we're gonna go back to this for um, at least half of our professional development and take a better look at um, what this looks like. Do we wanna use the same language um, for ninth and 10th graders and 11th, 12th graders and 7th and 8th graders or do we change the requirements for those skills? Great, so we are really here um, because we really want your feedback. So our next steps in the process are to continue collaborating with the Silas Dean um, staff and the high school staff together to continue working on this. Um, we envision also continuing to gather stakeholder feedback, having additional parent focus groups, um, and really we would love to sit down with the Board of Ed and really think about, well, what are your initial ideas? Take the real rough draft ideas that we have currently um, and really sit down and think about, well, what are you thinking? Um, I know you had a lot of conversations about what is this current mission and vision for the, the district. Um, and taking that feedback, I think, and that knowledge will be really helpful for us moving forward. Um, and we're hoping to have a, a finalized version of this um, for next school year, so the 2020-2021 school year, so we can begin to develop school-wide um, rubrics and assessment practices. So we'd really love your feedback. Maybe we could schedule a time to sit down and really look at this, the nitty-gritty. Right. Sure. 
I, I was well, more than willing to sit down. I sat down on the first one, which first been ten years ago, yeah. I think it yeah. was. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a very interesting plan for for me to learn, and and to put, you get much more knowledge about what's going on in your school. Um, so if Mr. Emmett can schedule a time or, or opens it up to when we can meet, it would be very interesting to me. Thank you. Any other board members have comments? Mr. Cassio. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for putting this together. I mean, it's nice to see something, you know, that you can hold on to. And we talk it, and the teachers do it, but now there, there's a plan that you're going to be able to follow. I'm curious, you're asking for feedback. How did the parents' meeting go last night? It went well. It, yeah, it went longer than we expected. Yeah, we were um, there for an hour and a half. Was there a good turnout? Did they give you good feedback? Um, we had 15 parents come up um, and come out last night. We met in the library media center at the high school. Um, we did have four or five people that emailed said they wanted to come out, but there's some, <coughs> some scheduling viruses problems. and scheduling problems going around. So, um, yeah, their, par their feedback was um, kind of interesting because it was um, actually underlining some of the issues that we thought we needed to address and some of the positives that we're also addressing. Good, because we're only as strong as the home is. Right. So the right. parents really need to be a part of this. You know, we can give you feedback, but I think the parents have to also uh, accept the, the model as well. So I think if you do more focus groups with parents, you know, you're, you guys will have an easier job. Yeah, there was a lot of energy last night. Okay. Any more board members? Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sharon and Kristen, great job. I know you put a lot of effort into it, and I think you're on the right path. Uh, I learned a new word tonight, holonomy. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that word and been to many years of schooling and I've never come across that word. So uh, glad to learn that and uh, excellent presentation. I wanted to explore with you just for a minute. You talked about the six visions of the graduate and you kind of, I guess, debated whether to put knowledge in there. Mm -hmm. And I have a freshman and a senior, so this is near and dear to my heart, but obviously for all the students across the district. Why did you take knowledge out uh, initially? And I would think that competency or knowledge Maybe I, I, maybe you're just it's understood to be part of all of it, but as a graduate, I would you know maybe want to have a certain competency level. So just want to get your feedback on maybe a little bit of that discussion or that reasoning to to, to kind of take that out. So um, as we looked at the skills that we were looking, we were kind of you know brainstorming for the vision of the graduate for the knowledge base. Um, it seemed like part of the knowledge for you know for instance social studies with. Um, actually being an active citizen and learning you know the processes and how things function that seemed like it was a better fit for um, perhaps some of those subject areas I know um, with problem solving and math seemed intertwined so closely mm -hmm. that it seemed redundant to have a knowledge base and then with the communication skills language arts and some of the other communities came up so um, and art and music as well um, and people felt that the skills that their subject areas were requiring looked like they would better fit in some of the six categories we have here. Um, seven seemed like a lot, and then, like Shannon said before, that maybe four is a better number. We're still in the process of, um, we did like um, putting personal wellness and then life and career skills together, because those do go hand in hand. And um, in talking to the parents last night, they had talked about the class of 2025 um, coming up and looking at self-awareness and self-health and balance in one's life and that's really personal wellness and a life and career skills um, so those kind of blended together yeah, so knowledge was really that overarching umbrella and then um, one of the things that we hope to come from this process is then looking at our current curriculum and saying well how are we teaching all of these skills right I teach math I teach problem solving every day what am I teaching how to be a good citizen how am I teaching collaboration I hope I'm doing that uh, but how can we really foster that and make sure it's happening throughout the district? Um, so I think the knowledge piece we had said as part of our PD to include bits of knowledge, um, but like personal wellness could be financial awareness, right? Financial literacy, reading and writing as part of being like a communicator. Um, so some of those basic mm -hmm. skills are kind of intertwined kind of automatically. It just depends on how are we assessing it as our indicators. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Granato. Um, first, thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, my immediate feedback to you, for you, is that you stuck with the, or you used the strategic plan, and I mm -hmm. so appreciate that. 
because it was not to be put on a shelf. It was to right. be used, and we made it skinny <laughs> for that purpose, is that people would utilize it. Um, and when you talk about feedback, too, we're now looking to you, the teachers, um, to give us, really, a lot of feedback about what's going on in the schools and what you see as the vision for a graduate. So that's what I most appreciate, in especially using our leader-leader model. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you for all your hard work, and it's off to a great start. Thank we you. look forward to Good. definitely meeting with you. Yeah, thank, you. Yeah. thank you, Chris thank and Shannon. Thank, thank you. you. All right, Mr. Armit, school improvement plans. Yes, we are in the process of um, rolling out our school improvement plans, and these plans typically in the past were done at a different time of the year, and we got some feedback from our administration that said, we needed to adjust the time period we did these because we didn't have really authentic data. So um, we are now uh, meeting here in January and we're going to move forward with the Weathersfield High School and Silas Dean Middle School School Improvement Plans this evening. We'll have the elementary schools presenting at the next regularly scheduled board meeting later on this month. All five at once. Mm -hmm. Great, well I welcome um, middle school and high school um, uh, teams, at least the high school to start um, to join me. So good evening, everybody. As part of our focus on continuous improvement, um, tonight you'll hear an overview of the school improvement plans, both from Silas Dean Middle School and Weathersfield High School. Um, I'm proud of the increased involvement that the leadership teams have had in, in improving um, school-based initiatives and improving student outcomes, as Mrs. Granado has already talked about our leader-leader model. So tonight, during tonight's presentation, you'll meet with some of our teacher leaders that have been involved in our leader-leader professional development with uh, Lyle Kurtman. And these uh, teachers meet regularly with their leadership team and their building administration. So Mr. Emmett's already talked a little bit about the new timeline for school improvement plans. Uh, I figured some of you would be like, it's January, the school year is almost, we're almost into exams, which means the year is almost half done. Um, and so as he's explained, this um, change in the timeline of our school improvement plans allows more time for our leadership teams to work while school, uh, school is in session around really identifying um, school improvement areas of focus. So before we start, I want to set the stage tonight with a reminder of the three goals found in the strategic plan. Um, I won't read them to you, um, but you can see them on the screen. Goal one is really focused around student achievement um, and looking at um, behavior, psychoacademic success, social emotional intelligence, collaborative problem solving, civic awareness con and contributions, and critical thinking. Goal two of our strategic plan is focused on civic and family engagement which really talks about breaking down the walls between the schools and the community and allowing um, learning opportunities both in and outside of the schools. And goal three of our strategic plan uh, focuses on management operations and finances. Um, and you can see some of the strategies listed there. So I wanna talk a little bit about how uh, the strategic plan um, is aligned to our school improvement plan. So in your Friday packet, you had an opportunity to review the middle school and high school um, school improvement plan, which tonight you'll hear a short overview. Um, those also can be found on our uh, district and our school websites now. And so on our school improvement plans, you'll see they're designed and organized in three uh, main focus areas, or what I call buckets, under academic goals, problem solving goals, and civic goals. So I wanna talk a little bit about why this is important. Um, academic goals are really about the application of skills and knowledge for students to grow. We want to ensure that our stu all students um, are growing in different areas. So we have a focus on that academic growth. But within that, we live in an age of information. And this ties back to the uh, vision of the graduate we just talked about. We live in an age of information. Um, the other morning in my house, uh, when we learned that Puerto Rico just had a large earthquake, um, my daughter said, is that a big earthquake? I said, I'm really not sure. And she said, Siri, what's a Richter scale? Siri, what's a big earthquake? And she comes back and says, Mom, that was a big earthquake. Right? So we live in the age of information. We just have to ask Siri. So problem solving is meant to be a large umbrella that looks at those large those skills, um, critical thinking, uh, 21st century skills, soft skills, uh, wellness. Um, it's a large umbrella to really look at critical skills. Um, and we call those skills a lot of different things. Um, and civic, um, the civic engagements. We in, as a community and our mission and our vision have a strong belief that we are preparing the next generation 
to vote and be uh, active project productive citizens in the democratic process, and that's essential to our democracy in our town. So we wanna ensure that our students um, have make a positive and meaningful contribution to school and the community. So what I want you to see is that these goals uh, in our school improvement plan are aligned to goal one and two of our strategic plan, the academic goal, but also the civic and family engagement. They're not meant to be individual buckets, um, and just kind of have to figure out what goes in which bucket, but you will actually hear and see some blending across these because if you have a productive um, student that's a problem solver, they are gonna be actively um, applying those skills in, in ways to help their community and their civic involvement, but in order to do that, they are using that academic knowledge. And again, we tie this back to our vision of a graduate. So these areas are the same areas you're gonna see uh, at our secondary schools, but also next board meeting um, when our elementary schools present. Um, so there is that alignment between what we are working on in our schools up to our strategic plan. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Moore in the high school to start, and then the middle school will be following. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having us today. Uh, I want to, first of all, thank our leadership team, which consists of our school administrators, as well as uh, a number of our school liaisons, uh, for really working together as the leadership team and overseeing the development uh, of the school improvement plan. Uh, our leadership team meets every week. Uh, we really uh, speak to a number of issues, uh, both curricular and non-curricular. So uh, any decisions that are made are made through the uh, lens of the uh, leadership team. Uh, certainly school improvement plan is one of the issues that uh, we spent a lot of time on and then all the uh, pieces of that. Uh, as Mrs. DeSoli mentioned, <laughs> Uh, we really did work out of those three particular areas. I'm gonna speak a little bit to the academic area. Mr. Mangino, who is the uh, department liaison for world language at Wethersfield High School, will speak to the problem solving. And Cindy Bryan, who is the department liaison for our counseling department, will speak a little bit uh, about the civic uh, area. So in terms of, of goal one, uh, you can see that uh, really we uh, focus on, on academics, appropriately so, uh, given what, what we do, right? So the, the first area uh, is this uh, appropriate, efficient, effective, and responsible use of, of technology. Uh, the board went to great pains last year to speak uh, and revise a little bit about the compliance, uh, the WPS acceptable use policy, and certainly that is a goal too. Uh, have our students use that technology, which Mrs. DeSoli mentioned, uh, in an appropriate manner, in a manner that facilitates learning and, and education. Uh, we do look at our goals uh, as SMART goals, right? So uh, in that particular vein, right, we have to look at standardized tests and we have to look at the quantitative nature uh, of, of our goals. So we, we did set some, um, some goals in terms of increasing by two points, uh, our SATs, right, in both areas, both in the ERW and uh, English uh, writing math, uh, as well as our math, um, a graduation rate of 95%, which I think is appropriate uh, for uh, a school of our ilk, and then credit attainment of 6.5 credits for freshmen, and I think research will tell you that if students get off to a good start in high school, they are more than likely to graduate within four years, move on to uh, their, their post-secondary uh, excitement, which mostly is college. Uh, some strategies, some new actions. Uh, we do have uh, an attendance committee that meets on Friday mornings. We meet, uh, quite honestly, sometimes hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Uh, consists of administrators, school counselors, school psychologists, social worker, uh, our nurses. We have a representative from DCF who comes to our, our meetings. So town, uh, Erica Teixeira from uh, the town social services uh, attends our meetings. Uh, we have a uh, representative from the courts uh, as well as our school resource officer. And we look at strategies 
for getting our kids in the right place, right? Sometimes some of our students have attendance issues, they have punctuality issues. It is impacting their ability to achieve and we try to figure out ways to uh, work, work with them. And this is something that has worked very well in the past and continues uh, to work well. I have to thank uh, my colleague, Mr. Michael Maltesi, uh, who is the administrator in charge of our online credit program, Edgenuity. And so along with Sandra Belanzaco, right, this is uh, an area that we are, are developing, right? And again, in terms of technology kind of coloring our, our world, uh, it's an area that students are comfortable with. They are the digital natives. We are the digital immigrants, people of my generation. They are comfortable in this learning uh, vehicle, right? So we, we want to make sure that we uh, increase that. Uh, certainly, department SAT improvement action plans uh, through our liaisons is, is something that is a strategy that uh, really um, helped us gain five points in our different areas, uh, ERW and math, last year. So that was uh, something that we wanted to continue, uh, continue with. The embedding of standardized test questions into uh, instruction. Uh, and we're, we're looking at certain areas that really have been very helpful. Khan Academy, right, has been something that has helped individual students uh, move forward in their own individual goals, right? And certainly the co-teaching model through the uh, leadership of Mr. Karzar, uh, we've implemented that at the high school. We were able to integrate uh, IEP goals in a manner which is mainstreamed into generalized instruction. So two particular areas that a uh, little bit that you heard about that, that are uh, new actions for, for us uh, and things that we have to focus on, two areas of focus. One is the whole NEASC, New England Association of Schools and Colleges accreditation process. We have our collaborative visit uh, early May this spring. So there's a lot that, that goes, uh, goes along with that. And so this is uh, a nice opportunity to really thank Kristen, Shannon, also uh, two other members of our steering committee, Matt Mangino and Nella Zalagi, for really their, their dedication, their urgency, their passion in getting this work done. This is very valuable work and it's through their efforts that they are coalescing the high school and the middle school in terms of a vision, in terms of getting everybody to row in, in the same direction. Uh, they deserve a, a lot of credit. Uh, also, you're gonna hear a little bit uh, later on the, this evening, uh, a challenge for us is this uh, implementation of the new state of Connecticut graduation requirements moving from 22.5 to uh, 25 credits. So that really is uh, where, where our focus is and where our efforts are, uh, especially the, this particular year. And so I'll turn it right over to uh, Mr. Mangino for our second goal, problem solving. Thank you. Um, as we continue with the student-based goals, we will emphasize a problem solving focus. So some of the important attributes include teamwork and collaboration. We will help students learn and demonstrate these positive team skills. We will implement a student-centered instructional approach and this will encourage Wethersfield High School students to take responsibility and ownership for their academic performance and continued success. We will focus on effective and efficient use of technology for teaching and learning in order to demonstrate mastery of the curriculum. This is part of our ongoing one-to-one -one Chromebook project. The building leadership team devised some strategies in order to foment problem-solving skills in our students. We're fortunate to have a block schedule to allow for more extended problem-based and collaborative learning activities. We will use problem-solving rubrics individually and across our departments, and we will document this use through our teacher evaluation plan and process. We will implement item analysis of standardized testing in order to improve future instruction and student outcomes in the near and longer term. We will thoroughly integrate some technology, we will thoroughly integrate technology into our classroom instruction with a particular focus on courses such as electronic music, which will allow students to focus on developing technological proficiency. And we'll now turn to our civic focus. Thank you, Mr. Mangino. So when we discuss the civic focus, we do have a focus, I believe, on looking at the vision of the graduate as well. We look at advisory. We look at how we educate our students, how we educate their minds, but how we educate them to be people that are going to be cooperative people, that are going to be team people, that are going to be people that are functional and productive citizens. When I talk to kids all the time, I never ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? I ask them, what do you want to do for a living? I want you to be happy, healthy, and productive. And part of that is being a good citizen. 
understanding what it means to be a good citizen, ethical behaviors towards yourself, others, and the environment. Making sure that you understand the global impact of your actions, as well as how you impact small as well. So when we look at around the building, we've got recycling bins. We've got kids that do cove cleanup. We have students that will volunteer to pack meals. So our students are very active in helping others, and we want to promote that. We want kids to continue to do that. When we look at our civic strategies and our new actions, we're looking at Wethersfield High School as a building that promotes relationships. Been here since 1998. Mr. Moore came on, I believe, in 2001. And I can tell you there is a different flavor to the building. The connections with a student is a huge thing for us. It is a part and parcel of what we do with the students every day. So Mrs. Bellinger, who's teaching math, she's not teaching math, she's teaching students. She's looking at them as people and helping them to be people and helping them to be productive citizens. Restorative practices helps our students understand when they've made mistakes, when they've done things wrong, when they've done things that have been harmful, to actually counsel them and talk them through their decision-making process and how they can change their ways and how it impacts others when they do change their ways and how they work with other people. Mr. Danaher, our vocational counselor, has done an amazing job bringing in the lunch and learns, bringing in speakers for students to understand what it means to work in different areas, what they can aspire to be, what they can aspire to do later in life and help them understand the paths that they can use to get there. The uh, Wethersfield um, Education Foundation has been very, very helpful in us in that by providing funding and helping us coordinate those circumstances. And a school-wide focus on not soft skills anymore. Not soft skills, what's it called now? Critical. Critical skills. Critical skills, because soft skills are, you know, handshaking, eye contact, those kinds of things, but they are critical skills. I remember distinctly my sixth grade teacher teaching us how to introduce ourselves to adults as opposed to peers and how to introduce other people. I got that from my family as well. Not every student gets that. So we work with that in advisory. Advisory has been a very strong um, avenue for us, I think, to make the connections with the kids, continue making connections with the kids, and to help them understand those things that we want them to be and grow into as they graduate from Wethersfield High School. And I think that's all. Mr. Moore? Great. Very good. Uh, I think we did spend a significant time of professional development learning how to shake hands, right, <laughs> leaning in, web to web, right, looking people in the eye. So uh, the, these critical skills certainly are, are uh, important. Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, in summary, a couple challenges, really, that we face in terms of a, a school Im improvement plan. Um, really, as we move forward, and as you'll hear a little bit more about our, our credit challenges, the high school will have really less ability to be as uh, accommodating and, and personalized when it comes to scheduling students into courses. And so that is a, uh, is a challenge for us moving forward. And you know, certainly the other uh, challenge and uh, more of a global uh, comment, it really is more challenging to improve when uh, you are, are continually having over years and years and years some attrition in terms of resources. So that, again, makes it a little bit more challenging uh, to to improve quantitative quantitatively and qualitatively right. so with that uh, we'd answer any questions certainly that the board might have about our school improvement plan for 2019-2020 right anyone with any questions for the high school Elaine um, <clears throat> Mike and, um, you spoke about restorative practice restorative practices yes, yes ma'am and that's a new term to many of us and am I hearing it correctly like it's a mediation session between somebody or is it a counselor that always has to deal with this or is it a teacher? So we did have some some um, some, some specific sure right we, we had some professional development Joanne Freiberg from the state of Connecticut came in uh, worked with the the staff it really is uh, because we do pride ourselves on being a relationship driven school when students have behaviors that break that that trust it's a way for teachers and then eventually so it is me mediation uh, administrators to help students understand how they they broke that trust broke that relationship and what can they do to restore it back to where we want it to be so in that in that essence uh, it is uh, a mediation a counseling session um, it doesn't happen all the time sometimes you know things are, are a little bit different right but as a rule we try to work with students we try to work with parents families in order for students to understand why their behavior was inappropriate and what they can do to restore that um, relationship positive relationship so this could be a math teacher and a you and a parent math teacher counselor every teacher across the board okay. 
Yes. I don't mean math, but that's when it no, comes no, to no. mind. No, no, <laughs> no. We like to pick on math teachers. <laughs> My oh, sorry, Shan. <laughs> Any other, Mr. Cassio? Yeah. Um, Tom, share with me how this information gets driven to the students. How do we uh, get this for them to see? Certainly the uh, biggest way is, is that it is on our website. Everything is technology driven right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, as it was uh, completed, Ms. Stoli made sure uh, that Mr. Telkey had it on our, our website uh, immediately. Uh, but specifically, we speak to a lot of these issues through our advisory program. Right, and that's how we break it down, right, and get to some of the uh, individual elements, right, of that. And it's through our teachers, through our advisory. Okay. Well, I'm trying to get at is I know the in the cafeteria there's a, a scroll a monitor that goes around. Di digital signage. Digital signage. Right. Um, Another new term. Scroll. Right. Scroll. Building committee. Scroll. Oh, we call We're it veteran. scroll, John. Get the paperwork out. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm just wondering if, you know, as, if this is brought to a classroom for instruction, for them to see it. We've got the presentation. It's a little bit different when you read it, but when the presentation is given, uh, it just seems to, I think, give a little bit more worth. Oh, I, I, I hear you, and I, I certainly agree. I think for students, the, the idea is about relevance, right? It's how is this going to affect me? How is this going to affect my education? What am I doing in the classroom right, right now? So uh, in working with, with our staff, what we, we try to do is have this generalized across disciplines by individual teachers in terms of what they're doing right in, in the classroom. Uh, as an example, I observed a, a nice class uh, looking at the causes of, of World War I. Right? And uh, the teacher was able to bring in some of the civic responsibilities right, in terms of how the causes of World War I affect our, our, uh, our world right now. Right, so again, they're trying to integrate that into their, their instruction. I just didn't know if the humanities group back there is aware of these. Uh, they are now. <laughs> right, they're gonna be tested on tomorrow. Quiz. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I'd just like to make a comment, and I think I saw it in the middle school's presentation too, is the advisory group is getting more and more important as far as communicating to the students and actually you have there on critical skills and empathy. Those discussions can be had there rather than a set curriculum, am I correct? You're absolutely correct, but it's also important to integrate it in those teachable moments, right? Mm -hmm. Again, as, as uh, we're, we're dealing with all the, the problems of the world. Uh, we did have a change uh, in our advisory this year under the uh, leadership of uh, Assistant Principal Tara Yusko. Uh, we had a teacher committee uh, really rewrite the curriculum. Right, so it really came from the teachers in terms of what they felt uh, would be relevant for, for the students. So it was developed by them o over, the sunder, uh, over the summer, distributed, uh, and I think that, that we have, uh, again, a very relevant advisory at this point. Great. And Tom, is, is that um, its first time through this year? The first time through this new advisory committee? Curriculum? Uh, yes, the, the new First curriculum is, is new this year, yes. So can we get some feedback on how they feel about it after? Oh, we have to, It'd yes. Right. So we will survey the, the yeah, students about it. that. Any more questions? So my question is, as I read about the implementing of student-centered instruction, which I th think is great because that aligns with the vision of the graduate. It does, and, and, and we rights, try to ensure that that happens. The citizenship communicated. What type of professional development has been provided for the teachers as we shift to this student? I know it's a huge shift for some people. It that. is, right, and it's been a focus uh, over, the, over the last se several years. Quite honestly, right now, right, our focus for professional development is in terms of uh, trying to, to satisfy our, our requirements for the accreditation piece. So this really is a little bit more planned for, for the future. Uh, however, um, because we do have a teacher evaluation plan which provides for the conversation, Right, each of the administrators has, uh, as they, they observe classes and so forth, an opportunity to have a, a discussion with teachers about how they are implementing student-centered instruction. Um, I used to go into the classroom and I would see the teacher being the hardest working person in the room, right? And that's not to say that isn't happening now, right? But I wanna see the students working hard also and I want them to have some ownership as to what, what they're doing. And so that's a, a little bit of a, you know, a little different for, for some teachers, so it's an ongoing process. All right, thank you. So. Anyone else? 
All right, thank you, Mr. Moore and staff. All right, thank you. Thank you. And now the South Sea Middle School Leadership Team. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rosalind Bannon. I am the very proud principal of Silas Dean Middle School, and I have brought with me tonight um, members of our very hardworking leadership team, uh, Melissa Morello, Matt Burlow, and my assistant principal, Cindy Fries. I want to tell you um, a little bit this, this evening about our process and how we came up with what we wanted to put into our school improvement plan. We had multiple conversations with not only our leadership team, but also our entire staff. And the staff had uh, multiple opportunities to sit with a draft and also a blank template of our school improvement plan to put down what some of their ideas were that they thought would be very important for us. SDMS is a wonderful place to learn and work. And it is comprised of almost 600 unique learners. We have 92 special education students, 57 students with 504 plans, and 88 students who are currently in the SRBI process. This means that basic classroom instruction must be carefully tailored to meet the various needs and to adhere to all of the various individual plans that many students need to be successful in the classroom. With that said, inclusiveness and equity are very important considerations for us at Silas Dean to focus on. To do that, we decided that we need to create opportunities for staff to engage in discussions that pertain to the whole child. And you will see that theme come up throughout our presentation, that theme of focusing on the whole child and focusing on not only the academic needs of the child, but their social emotional needs as well. At the middle school, we find that that particular age, sometimes the emotionality can often impact their ability to access their education. So we need to find a way to break down the barriers that exist and connect with the students so that they can be most successful. At SDMS, we are beginning to examine and refine our instructional practice relative to our student achievement. So one of our hopes for our academic goal, as you see listed on the board, is to assure that all students make at least one year's growth and reach 100% of their growth targets. We're fortunate to have a relationship that is extremely supportive and reciprocal with John Carzar and, Sue, and Liz Friedis of the Special Education Department. Together, um, we are working on planning and programming with our staff that focuses on inclusive practices to assure that all students are provided with an equitable educational experience. Through this work, we determined that the practice of leveling our language arts classes, and I know this has been a hot button topic for many people, but we were able to ascertain that that practice was in fact deterring equitable and inclusive practices. Through discussions with parents and discussions with students, we came to the conclusion that there was a misnomer in the community that SDMS was in fact offering an honors level course and that this, there was a stigma being placed on students who were placed in a level two class. And that does not equate to the definition of equitable. So research demonstrates that heterogeneous grouping supports inclusive practices and equity and levels the playing field for all students. Heterogeneous grouping also supports students taking risks and being able to be role models for each other. In our quest, some of the new actions and strategies are listed on the board, but we felt that one of the main things to highlight this evening is the fact that we really want to focus on continuing to strengthen our SRBI process and to strengthen our tier one instruction that takes place in the classroom. Because the classroom is a place that's filled with needs of so many different learners, we know that our foundational classroom instruction is where the rubber meets the road. So our teachers have to be really well versed in what each child's plan is, what their specific needs are, and different ways to reach those different learners and to differentiate instruction. We want to make sure that we meet every child's needs so that the children can be happier and more successful at school. 
To accomplish that, we plan to develop professional learning communities through which collaborative discussions will result in the sharing of strategies to further meet students' needs. During our SRBI meetings, we try to have all the key players at the table, which means we not only have the regular education teachers, we have the special education teachers. We also bring in our school psychologist and our um, school counselor to the meetings as well as administrative representation to truly have a deep discussion about what a particular child's challenges and strengths are. We are finding that in many cases, our students aren't quite aware of what their um, strengths and weaknesses are. So another approach that we're taking is to implement school-wide goal setting days. Research has shown that when students know what their strengths and weaknesses are and set a goal and work towards that goal, and then the entire school community has an opportunity to celebrate their growth, achievement, accomplishment, and improvements, students do well. And we know how important it is for middle schoolers to feel good about themselves. And at Silas Dean, we feel that the children's success is our success. I'm going to have Melissa Morello tell you a little bit about our problem solving goal. Thank you. Okay, so problem solving has been a theme tonight. Um, you've heard that the middle school and the high school have collaborated with the vision of the, the graduate and hold problem solving as like a key skill that we want for all of our students. Um, and it's a competence that like goes beyond just intellectual as Ms. Bandon has said that we want it to spread across the emotional needs of our students as well. So our goal is to have students learn and apply the knowledge to demonstrate growth and understanding again not just academically but um, emotionally as well. So we are going to be using um, our CARE acronym that we developed as a staff shared decision making. We came up with what did we want students and staff to be held accountable for. And so as you can see CARE stands for collaborate, holding students and teachers accountable, respecting one another, and being empathetic. So our goal is that students will grow in this area. Um, so in this time of transition for students, the students are progressing from me to we, and children need to understand how their actions impact the community at large. For this, we would like our staff to be trained in the restorative practices that you heard the high school talk about as well. Um, so that disciplinary actions are also met with an opportunity for reflection as well as the natural consequence. Therefore, we will see multiple references to social emotional learning also in the next part of our SIP. Uh, just as a student is screened for math and reading to see if there's any deficits, one of our strategies is going to be that we are going to screen students for their social emotional um, learning so we can see um, what deficits are there and then we can begin improving our SRBI process on the emotional side of the triangle. Um, so as with academics, we will incorporate goal setting. Uh, in advisory, students can use the results from their social emotional screening tests and the rubrics that we're collaborating with the high school so they can find where they are with their social emotional intelligence and then they can set a goal for themselves. Um, so from there, we can like celebrate when they make their growth and that's our goal for them. Um, research shows that recognizing positive student choices is linked to improved behavior. So we will be engaging in these team-based assemblies to support them and acknowledge their growth. Um, so similarly to what the high school said, uh, you know, ours looks a lot like there's, you know, looking for our students to exhibit our, our core values of care. Like she said, when we have discussions with students, we reference those, those core um, uh, expectations. Um, with the restorative thing, we've had a little bit of training. We certainly want to move toward that. But it, it comes down to even very simple things like asking a question, what happened versus what are you doing? Um, getting the child to recognize that they have a voice and can share what their side of a story before feeling uh, that they've been accused of something. So what happened? You know, was that action okay for the time and place you were in? Um, so that's that's sort of an ongoing conversation. We've redone our 
um, our code of conduct. Um, so moving away from a discipline thing to a code of conduct, expecting students and sharing with them what do we expect of you. All throughout our building, you'll find expectations. What does it look like, sound like, and feel like to demonstrate any of those um, qualities of care. So we have it for the cafeteria, we have it for the classrooms, we have it for the hallway, we have it for the gym, so that students know what they're expected to be demonstrating. Um, so that kind of goes along with demonstrating a respectful and ethical behavior towards their sel themselves, staff, and students. Um, we are looking to move toward um, students really being able to kind of start taking ownership and co-leading some decisions about what kind of community service projects we can do as a team, um, and learning about their personal role in their community. Uh, some of the new actions, um, again, continuing our focus on the kindness and empathy, school-wide goal-setting days, and then celebrating those um, accomplishments and civic projects that they might be creating and their own personal growth, and increasing that service learning-based project um, of those, with those 21st century skills and those critical skills. Um, you know, every morning it starts with, you know, Ms. Bannon and I greet the kids every morning, good morning, how are you? Um, so that every kid's coming into a welcoming place. So we want them to recognize, I've seen so many kids now start, not, I don't have to initiate anymore, they come in, hey, how are you? So it's really that those modeling it and having it be a part of everything we do at all times. It's not a curriculum, it's not a lesson, it's just what we do. And that's kind of how we are focused on that now. Matt, oh, I jumped in and took yours. Thank you. Um, and to speak a little bit to the 21st century skills um, and some of the things we're saying that we're going to start next year, we're actually doing some of those right now. So just last week we had uh, the students out of the advisory program get together on their teams and they presented about what SDMS has developed as their 21st century skills. Now there, there were some common elements um, with uh, the high school vision of the graduate, there was communication, there was collaboration, there was problem solving. So they got together in the advisory classes and they made presentations that they would give to um, their teams about what each of those skills were. We got together and did that. And I can say at first, I, would, I was a little worried about it because my thought wasn't, will the kids be able to? My thought was if I took 90 adults and I broke them up into six groups and told them to make a presentation and then come together on one day and to show it to everyone, would that go very well? And my thought was, I don't know 90 people. So no, it wouldn't really <laughs> go well. But they did a really good job of it. They were in control of it. They dealt with technical problems. They presented to each other. When there was an issue with someone's behavior, the students corrected it. They ended up kind of like appointing like a talking stick thing. Somebody had a gesture was like, hey, do you want to use it when you go? And then everyone just started doing that. And when somebody had it, they were paying attention to that. And it really is, um, as was mentioned before, that age needs this transition from the idea of me to we. And those things really are working on that 21st century skill and some of these strategies we've mentioned. That concludes our part of the presentation. Do you have any questions for us? Any board members with questions? Yes, Ms. Paradise. A um, <clears throat> couple notes I, I made when I was reading through this. Um, and I, I questioned this just to connect to the high school. Um, you mentioned that heter heterogeneous group is, is research-based and working well, and I have no doubts about that. But if you're asking for that in the classroom <coughs> and you have the range, high to low in there, you're demanding much more of the classroom teacher. And... Um, and then you talk about strengthening SRBI um, and the teachers doing needing help to do this um, because there's so many SRBI positions. Um, I just feel that we're asking a lot of just the classroom teachers. Um, and my two thoughts are, should we look for some help with other personnel to uh, for the SRBI in the classroom? and in the heterogeneous grouping, how will we determine when we go to leveling at your high school? What, 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 if the eighth grades are heter, heterogeneously grouped, high, low, is there a screening that we use now to decide or help? Just, just to clarify for sure, me. Sure, let me clarify for? too for um, where we are changing our practice is only in language arts okay. and in math because we offer two separate courses right. at each grade level. Math is remaining the same because okay. that isn't necessarily okay. leveling. Right. It's two different courses. Right. Okay. So in language arts, we do follow as um, the elementary schools do okay. the uh, Columbia 
a readers and writers workshop model. And within that, that is a model where you teach the same skill, right. but every child learns at a different uh, level and reads from a different book that is tailored to their right. individual needs. Okay. So with that, um, each group is working at their own level. Okay. And what we're also hoping to do this year is taking a deeper dive and um, paying more um, specific attention to creating our classes next year because of this. Oh, great. So um, what, what I would like to do, and I haven't been able to talk with Mr. Stoley and uh, Mr. Emmett about it yet, is have some collaborative time with the elementary schools yeah. before May and June, when we usually do. Um, if we could do that sooner, that way we could create more strategic teams and assure that those language arts classes have a, a decent mix so that you have five high kids, you have five lower kids, and then in the middle you have the rest of the group. So doing some more strategic planning in that regard. That way it doesn't end up being, like currently what we have in some classes, we have a heavy, heavy mix of children who have IEP plans, who have 504s, and and it is a lot of work for the teacher. Yeah. We're hoping that by um, strategically placing kids like this and paying careful attention to our teaming process, that in fact it will be uh, not as much of a burden on the teacher. And we've started this year through our SRBI meetings by having all the players at the meetings, having very rigorous and deep conversations about the students. And um, teachers are really getting to know the needs of the kids yeah. through these conversations. And by having the support staff and the special education staff at the meetings, they're able to offer strategies that perhaps the regular education teacher didn't think of. Well, I agree because I, you know, having taught elementary, yes. you made your levels in your classroom and you got, because you had them six hours a day, you got to know them personally. You guys have 45 or whatever minutes you have. Right. And so it's a, it's, you have to do it over time. Correct. Within two weeks, you could tell who was meeting you for what with a, in a regular classroom. Correct. Um, you mentioned the example of a goal. What, what does that mean? What we would like to have the children do is um, set a goal for themselves, an academic goal and a social emotional oh, goal. Okay. So really taking a look reflectively at okay. how they've done for the marking period. So at the beginning of the school year, they would think back and reflect on what they did in sixth grade or what they did in seventh grade. Take a look at their assessment results as well. Think about their academic standing, think about their social emotional wellness and needs, and create goals for themselves along with the teachers. Okay, um, so they would be assigned a teacher to do this with? In advisory. In, oh, in advisory, mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yes, that this would take place in advisory. Okay. okay, yes. Okay, and, and what is a school-wide goal setting? Uh, we mean? would have it all on one day. So oh. certain days are advisory okay. days, so that would be a school-wide goal setting. And okay. then as far as the celebrations go, those would take place school-wide as well. That way we can recognize yeah. the students for meeting their goal or for the improvement okay. that they made because it's it really, really things. important okay. to recognize improvement as well. And um, Mr. Barlow, you mentioned that we're starting restorative practice training there. And have you felt that it's been you, or one of you mentioned this? I did, yep. I'm sorry. We also um, had Joanne, I went to Joanne Freiburg, Kylene Cassio came with me, we've brought it back to the staff and we had one of her counterparts yeah. come and do a quick training with us. Yeah. Um, so that's been something we've been working on, but do certainly. Do you think it's going positively? Have you been in the, has it yes. been in use? Yeah, is you know what, what it I'm is, saying? it Are really. Are still on the training end of it? Um, you know what it is, I think, <laughs> I think Melissa can speak too, because she was part of the, um, we, our code of conduct <laughs> creation, that it's, it's really about, in, as they said at the high school, it's a yeah. relationship thing. It's yes, about, it's, it's, a it's a mindset. It's, it's a mindset. It's not a thing, just, it's a mindset. Good. It's yeah. how do I connect with every kid? Yeah. And what do I know? Do I know their name? Can I greet them yeah. every day at the door? Can I, you know, can I have that conversation with them where there's a concern? Can I have that conversation with them and their parent? You know, one of the other things I do, you, you were laughing about handshakes, but I, I you know, I try to, there's, yeah. You know, when they give me the limp fish, I go, no, no, let's try that again. <laughs> you know, and we, we instruct them on those little things, you know, and we talk to them about like, so how do you think you can fix this? And how does the person who's been wronged feel like they, what do they need from this to be fixed? So you've minimally employed and put it in practice. Yes. You would say, and, and yeah. so far you're feeling good about it. I, I think and, and yeah, you can just that. add yeah. to that. Um, so you bring up some great questions yeah. too, and I'd like to speak to some of the other ones as well. Um, so with restorative practices, 
um, one thing that we like to, like our vision is that it's not that you're a bad student, right. you made a bad choice, right. and mm -hmm. you get an opportunity to fix that. Um, so that's very powerful, but I think because it's been a limited training for a few mm -hmm. of our staff members that have gone, we want to share that with all the staff oh, yeah. so that when they're engaging just in the minimal classroom thing, mm -hmm. you know, where like a student throws something across the room, they know how mm -hmm. to approach yeah, it yeah, in yeah, a restorative yeah. way. Be consistent, yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. So we'd like our whole <laughs> staff to be exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, also to speak to what you were talking about with regards to um, our students being in unleveled classes in the middle school, but then how do we prepare them for level classrooms in the high school? We do have criteria for each content area um, based off of some standardized test scores. Oh, so good. for math, I could say it's STAR, SBAC, the Iowa readiness test, as well as classroom performance. Yeah. Um, and we collaborate with the high school teachers. Right. We're gonna be talking about this um, at our February PD um, when we vertically align with them um, so that was one thing. And the other I wanted to share with you, you brought up some great questions, I just have to say. Um, I've been in your seat. Yes. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for that. Um, so yeah, so for, as for the SRBI, I just have to give amazing credit to Roslyn because we as, as STMS, we were trying. We were trying to get the SRBI. It's not like we weren't. We really were. But she came in and she gave us such a structured way to look at it, and we're still adapting to that model. I could see the vision, and what we're doing right now is students are going to, that are identified as an area of need, whether it's an emotional area of need, a behaviorally, or if it's in an intellectual area of need. Students are brought up, we talk about them, we come up with a plan for them and a goal for them. And after two rounds of trying different strategies to work with that student, if they don't meet the goal in both of those rounds, then we start to escalate it to like a tier two plan, oh, which wonderful. could be a yeah, which yes. could be a pull up. Right. So we're still in the process. Yes. Finally, we just got her, fine so we're very it. happy. Yeah, fine we're fine tuning it, yeah, and we and yeah. we need to strengthen that, um, and that's one of our goals for a whole staff. Yeah. And that might help the. Um, classroom teacher too, mm -hmm. yes. instead of right. all of it falling on them. Exactly. You, you guys can the do team more approach. strategy. Yes. The team exactly. Thank you very much Thank for all you. that information. Thank you for your question. Any more questions, Bobby? Um, I just have one. I asked Sally um, just yesterday um, if she could explain for all the board or send out an explanation of what SRBI is. Oh. Um, it's, you know, the lingo <laughs> of <laughs> educators. <laughs> But it's something that's been in practice since like 2008? Yeah. Oh, yes. So long. Yeah. In education, we use a lot of acronyms. So thank you, Mrs. Granada, for, for stopping us with that one. Um, SRBI, I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, it's called, it's a national um, uh, model. It's called RTI in every, all, every around the world, around the state, uh, I'm sorry, country. Um, in Connecticut, we like to have our own name. So we call it SRBI, which is Scientifically Based Research uh, Interventions. And so this is just a little pamphlet we have um, in district to provide for um, families. Um, if you want to take a look at the, in the back, you'll see a triangle. So you'll often uh, um, talk to us, we'll talk about three tiers to SRBI. And so really it's a model of looking at um, providing extra additional support for some students. So if you notice the large, tri on the bottom of the triangle is what we call tier one. Most of our students are in tier one and respond very favorably to our core curriculum. But sometimes students need a little extra. They need a little extra help with reading or a little extra help with math. Um, it might be for a short term um, to kind of help with some skill development. That's what we call tier two. Um, and then tier three would be um, some additional more frequent um, help and assistance. And then um, if this type of kind of intervention doesn't work, we then go to child find special education and look if there's a potential um, learning disability. So this is a, what we refer to as SRBI. It means providing extra help to students that may need some extra help. Um, and then we call tier one is really core curriculum, all students. Um, and we say kind of going up the triangle as we provide additional supports and structures for students to help them be successful in the tier one curriculum. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Any more, Mr. Cassio? Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks. Thank you so much for the presentation. I know you guys got a lot of spare time over there, so. <laughs> 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 Only kidding. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> all right. I I know last year, uh, whether so, I mean, Silas Dean Middle School went through a transition, mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy to hear that it's moving in, in a positive direction. But more importantly, there was a lot of staffing transitions yes. where we took down a, 
an individual from the high school to take over a para position uh, that was uh, like a timeout person or someone to go there to help out with that particular uh, venue, as well as removing a physical education instructor uh, and not having that person be replaced. So I, I, I just want to know how things are working with those changes in the building and to move forward on your new actions and strategies mm -hmm. because that alone was a new strategy that you had to do. That individual was removed and someone else came down with the hopes of continuum, but is that, did that really happen? Yes, um, the individual who came down and joined us from the high school, uh, we are very, very appreciative still that we have her, and um, she and our school psychologist started up our human relations class. And the human relations class um, specializes in services for our neediest children with emotional challenges. And that classroom has been seeing um, great success and um, I like to think that it helps prevent some outplacements mm -hmm. for students. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that regard, um, it's relationship-based, and um, the point of the um, classroom, opening that classroom, was to make sure that children were accessing their uh, mainstream courses. And I'm happy to say those children are accessing their mainstream courses more often than they were before. So there is great success with that classroom. The um, individual that you are referring to in the program that was um, eliminated through the budget process and talks with the staff was the RTC program. And um, what the RTC program was, was it was a place where children who were having some behavioral difficulties could go um, if they weren't focused appropriately in the classroom. So um, what has happened with that is that it has put, as um, Ms. Paradise referred to, more stress on the teachers because they are more responsible for that tier one behavior um, plan. So if a child is talking out too often, it is the teacher who is responsible for redirecting that behavior again. Um, and the behaviors that Mrs. Fries and I generally saw in our office anyway were the level three and level four behaviors. So in some cases, what is occurring is some of those borderline behaviors that are in between like a level two and a level three, Mrs. Fries and I end up with those children in our offices. We are putting them, uh, we're watching them for the day. We are handling the consequence and um, we're assuring that they are receiving their education and doing their work with us somewhere in the, in the, um, in the main office. I know that there are mixed reviews from teachers not having an RTC, and um, we had a team leader meeting last week Thursday, and some of the team leaders were wishing that we could have RTC back. I'll be very candid, um, and I know that we're all about transparency because we want to know what's happening, and everyone cares about the kids in Weathersfield. Um, I have to say that our suspensions have gone down since we haven't had RTC, and also our referrals have gone down since we haven't had RTC. That's not to mean that the teachers are still not referring kids or are not writing the documentation for it, but there is an improvement in the general climate of the building. Um, every morning we focus on kindness and we focus on um, our core values to try to set the tone for the day and make sure everyone stays positive. Is it perfect? No. There's probably about 10% maybe of the children in the entire building who are having behavioral challenges. That is, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be in the lunchroom, and what Mrs. Fries and I have been doing along with the teachers is trying to collaborate with the parents, collaborate with the students, and use that restorative approach. And I have to say, I have seen teachers, um, by not having RTC, communicating with parents more about some of those issues because they feel more responsible for the behaviors instead of turning it out. Is it more stressful for them? Probably yes, but it is a mindset change. Coming from where I came from in New Haven, the level one and level two um, offenses were always handled by teachers. 
um, and it was a collaboration with teachers and parents. And I feel that by teachers and parents working together, that strengthens the relationship um, that the child sees for the school. And we can really work together to help work through the problem and eliminate the issues that are happening. Teachers have also begun, the team leaders have been great about this. They're holding more team meetings with parents coming in. They'll come into the office, can I use the conference room today? We have a team meeting with a parent. Or we have a team meeting with a parent today. Do you want to join us? Can you join us just to support us? So I think the relationships have strengthened. But at the same time, like we talked about, it's a mindset change. And when you've been in a building for so long and you've been used to having an RTC for 14 years and suddenly you don't have RTC anymore, it's an adjustment. But I think they're being very successful with the adjustment and I think it's helping the students as well. Could yeah. we use support in a different form? Absolutely. What was happening truthfully with RTC was students were getting sent out of the classroom we weren't getting a call to the office. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, a student's getting sent to RTC, but you're not calling for anyone to, to escort the child. How poorly behaved can they actually be? And they're sending them to this RTC room so they're not able to access their education, which in the state's eyes, if you're out of your room for more than 90 minutes and away from instruction, that's considered a suspension. So we have to be mindful of the legalities of that as well, because our point is always to keep the children in the classroom as, as much as we can. So that was one of the concerns I worried about too with RTC. It seemed like it was the type of thing that it was very easy to send them to RTC when we looked at some of that data. And perhaps the children, um, it, it could have been a simple redirection. It could have been a simple phone call to the parent rather than this process of sending the child out of the room for 20 minutes, half an hour at a time. But I, I agree with you that there should be some type of maybe an in-house. We need to call it what it is. If you have the child away from instruction, they're away from instruction. And technically, in the state's eyes, that's either an in-school suspension or an out-of-school suspension. To follow up, so in restorative practices, yes. the students is supposed to reflect on their behavior. Yes. And then be brought back to the teacher and then there's supposed to be a conversation. So who's handling that reflection part with the student? The counselors are, are jumping in. The school psychologists are jumping in. Uh, of course, Mrs. Fries and I, and it involves and involves the teachers. Right. I was right. just wondering about the reflection part. Okay. Just, yep. Yeah, we're the, handling the reflection. The what could you have done differently? The counselors are handling the reflection. Even the teachers are handling the reflection piece. So yeah. one of the things, Melissa, I think your team does this. So we had the reflection form that we used in RTC. Many of the teachers are keeping that in their rooms and asking the students when there's a moment or something that they need to reflect on to use that as a guide for their reflection. And then they're just kind of integrating it into their conversations, you know, and saying so, you know, because a lot of those kind of things are the minor things. I was chewing gum and I shouldn't have been. I was yeah. talking out too often and I shouldn't have been. Got um, out of my seat. I got out of permission. my seat. You know, what? how is that impacting? Or I threw a pencil across. Those things that, okay, I, I can see now that that wasn't the right time and place for this. How can I reflect on it? How can I change my, my thinking? Um, and can I have a conversation with my teacher and recognize that, okay, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm feeling antsy. What are my other options? Some of the other <laughs> things that come into play is we have many, many students who um, have ADHD. And we have to be cognizant of that and how we're dealing with those children and make sure that we're treating them equitably. In some cases, they can't help their behavior. That's a characteristic of who they are. So we need to accept that and figure out a way to uh, accommodate that in our classrooms and to help them learn the best way that they can, whether that be by changing our, um, uh, the, our delivery of instruction or possibly giving them preferential seating or something along those lines. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, just one comment. Sure. I think <coughs> when you um, build a relationship with a kid, and I think the teacher, because they, they were all with me all day long, you can build those individual relationships, mm -hmm. and they will perform for you yes. mm -hmm. after a while. It yes. just takes time. And right. The biggest problem all of you have is that maybe your class loads are 120. Right. Whereas the tops I had was 30, you mm -hmm. know, but, but they were with me six hours, so right. I could do that. That's you why our with, with 130, it's a little harder to build the connection it that is. is meaningful. It is. And then they disip the discipline sort of dissipates because they...
the form for you. And, and the message we try to extend to the teachers, because they're on that teaming approach, there's got to be at least one or two teachers on the team that connect with each individual yeah. student. So they have that special right. person that they can yeah, go to exactly. that believes in so them. I think a given time, it will all come yes. together. Agreed. Yes, absolutely. We're on the right path. Um, one comment, Ms. Granado and I had an opportunity to walk through South and it was excellent. I thought we saw great things, and we're very happy. And oh, thank on you. a personal note, my son is, loves it there, and he's doing great. He's oh, great. Grade, so thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. The first reading of the proposed graduation requirements, policy 5300, reference four. I believe we have a presentation. We do, uh, Mr. Carey. We have a presentation by uh, high school staff, team leaders, and administration. Uh, we have been here before with regard to graduation requirements. We had uh, passed an increase in graduation requirements due to some uh, budget cuts in previous years. We had to rescind. So. The state has no longer allowed us the flexibility. It's mandated etched in stone. So I bring you the leadership team from Weathersfield High School. Good evening once again. Thank you for having us. Uh, we were uh, able to provide this uh, presentation to the uh, Policy and Planning Committee. So we appreciated the uh, questions and feedback from that. Um, it does, uh, this is the second iteration of the proposed graduation requirements. As Mr. Emmett mentioned, we have been here before. It's like Yogi Berra said, it feels like deja vu all over again. So here we are. Uh, we years ago had 22.5 credits. In an effort to get ahead of what was a proposed uh, state requirement, several years ago we moved to 25 credits as the credit requirement for a diploma at Weathersfield High School. Uh, we were able to do so with also the uh, idea that we were going to be adding some staff in order to provide the courses uh, to allow us to do the uh, 25 credits. Uh, because of difficult budget years that didn't happen, uh, the board uh, voted to move back to 22.5. Uh, the state, in their infinite wisdom, has now implemented the 25 credit uh, requirement for our current freshman class. So we have three classes of Weathersfield High School that have requirements for 22.5 credits uh, with a particular type of distribution. Uh, and then the freshman class and certainly the upcoming eighth graders for next year uh, with a uh, different credit requirement. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is just um, thank all the committee members, uh, especially Ms. Yusko, who has led uh, the discussions in terms of what we are going to do, the leadership of Ms. DeStoli, uh, in terms of how are we going to uh, work through what is uh, our new, new requirement. Uh, we've had several meetings. Uh, last year, uh, Ms. McCurdy was a Board of Ed representative on our committee and uh, helped with some insight in that uh, budget area. So really, what is it that we're trying to do? Uh, our committee is petitioning, asking the Board of Ed to uh, put into policy what is the new state statute. What will that do? Uh, that will really provide opportunities uh, for flexibility. And that's really what we're, we're looking to do. We're looking to personalize and uh, be flexible for, for our students. And we feel that the new state requirement, their verbiage will allow us uh, to, to do so. And you can see here more student choice. Uh, and then there is this uh, whole idea of a mastery-based diploma assessment, which is uh, a little bit of an enigma. I mean, we'll speak a little bit more to that, right? So uh, as we, um, uh, let me see, as we, mo we move forward, uh, what you can see is that uh, the, the state has changed the requirements uh, into a couple different areas, right? Uh, students would have to uh, get 25 credits. Let me just move, move backwards for a second. I guess that's, oh, okay. It was just in, in the wrong spot. Um, nine credits in the humanities, nine credits in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, uh, one credit for world language, a credit uh, 
uh, in physical ed in wellness, another credit health and safety education, uh, this enigmatic uh, mastery based diploma assessment for a credit and three electives. Our school counseling department, uh, really Ms. Lindsay and Ms. Bryan have worked through our list of courses to identify what those courses will be. Will they be a humanities? Will they be counted as a STEM, uh, towards the STEM requirement? Or could they be either or? And it's important to note that it would be either or as opposed to both. You can't double up in terms of, of credit. So that is what it would look like, right? A large bucket in terms of humanities, a large bucket in terms of STEM, the state not telling you specific courses that students have to have to graduate, allowing the schools, allowing uh, the students and the families to really kind of mix and match in terms of uh, what their interests are, right? So I'm going to, to go backwards because Ms. Lindsay is going to talk a little bit about typical pathways and I will just alert you that you're gonna have to skip over that next one to That's get to okay. the next one, right? Okay, thank you. Um, so if you're familiar with our current graduation requirements, every student who graduates from Weathersfield High School has to meet specific core requirements and they're pretty prescribed. With the new state standards, it allows us to be a little bit more flexible and work with the student as an individual learner. So we have students that are STEM focused. They love their math and science. Um, that is their focus. They're your future engineers, your actuaries. Um, and we set up a pathway, if you look under in the first column, of meeting all the graduation requirements while leaning towards their preference of math and science, um, still getting their English, still getting their social studies, but with a, with a heavier um, lean towards this, the sciences. Um, we have humanity students, who, students who um, like the art, the English, um, the social sciences, again, meeting those nine gradu graduation requirements in the humanities, meeting their minimal graduation requirements, the STEM, but picking up a lot more electives in the humanities in their areas of focus. Um, and also some of their STEM electives could be one of those either or models that we were talking about. And then we also have some very artsy students, our band students, we have a phenomenal band, some of our musicians, uh, allows them to fulfill their desire in the arts as well as meeting their core graduation requirements. We think it's important to note that um, while the state doesn't mandate that a student has four credits of English, we are of course going to recommend all students take four years of English to meet that humanities requirement, three years of social studies, but it does give us a little flexibility for those students who don't meet that kind of cookie cutter, everything is gonna be the same for everybody. Um, and so this is kind of a comp comparison between the 23 and 22. And that's Kara. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kara Alexopoulos. I'm the science liaison. Um, so what you have here is um, what the state requirements are, not necessarily what Weathersfield High School uh, requires of our students in the left-hand column. So under current law for sophomores, juniors, and seniors, they re are required to have 20. We require them to have 22.5. Um, we also designate certain sciences, for instance, they have to have a life science, they have to have a physical science. That's not necessarily how the wording was uh, over the last uh, few years. And so um, we are asking um, for when we go to the 25 credits to be the state um, wording, so that way we can keep that flexibility that um, Jen Lindsay was just talking about. Um, so instead of saying it has to be just four English or three social studies, um, three math, two science, we are just lumping them as the state is suggesting of nine credits in humanities, um, still considering that civics that we of course would want them to have um, and art. Um, nine credits in the STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, and that can look very different for different students. It doesn't have to be the exact same science courses, of course, again, um, to be successful uh, at getting into college, you want specific ones, but uh, a lot of students would want to follow um, the freshman through, so th through junior year specifically. Um, then we need one credit in physical education and wellness, one credit in health and safety, and um, as somebody may mention after me, uh, we're looking into how uh, that is going to look for us um, given that 
uh, the titles of our courses may change. Then we have uh, one credit in world language, which the first iteration when we went to 25 credits was two, so we're just asking for one, and then the one credit of mastery-based diploma assessment. Um, again, we are looking for ex as much flexibility for our students as possible, looking for some pre-prescribed for students getting into college and things like that, but allowing for that flexibility when we're we're talking about scheduling and course availability. So um, I believe Tyler, Mr. Webb, is going to talk about that mastery base um, next to um, Kara, can I ask that. a question on that one? When you said one credit in world language, yes. what do you mean by that one credit? When you took, well, many, many years ago, took Latin. So I had three years of Latin. I think I had three <laughs> credits, right? Or four yes. credits, whatever, how many years I did. Yes. So if it, it, would that be one credit in language, like to your sophomore year, and that's it, done? Is that what so again, we're looking at what the state is requiring. So what we're asking uh, as approved as a state requirement of one credit. Oh. Colleges are yeah, wanting more, yeah, but and so I'm most kids about. are going to have more. But okay. this is the base this amount. Is the basic this state. is what the state is asking. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Good evening. So um, I'm going to talk about the enigma called uh, mastery-based uh, credit that's going to be awarded to students. And, and really what it is, um, in the spirit of flexibility, which seems to be just the theme of having this greater amount of credits but putting them into more or lesser buckets, humanities and STEM, um, mastery-based uh, is, is really in its, in its nascent stage right now. When Mr. Moore and Ms. Yesko called the state this summer about getting some guidance, they said, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we'll get back to you. So um, we then kind of, I, we see this as exciting work where we can look at um, different opportunities for kids to show that they have learned something potentially outside of the classroom um, and can be awarded credit. So uh, primarily what we're looking at now is we look at as we move forward with our vision of the graduate work uh, and some of those skills that potentially um, students can reflect upon and talk about and share as an experience outside of the classroom, that can be something that we could then look at. And we're gonna be doing that with guidance, potentially using advisory um, as we move forward. By the time that the, the freshmen now graduate, they will all have gained a mastery-based um, credit in, of some sort. I'm gonna now hand it over to Mrs. Bryan. Hi, Cindy Bryan again. So what we have in front of us, uh, we have so three sample students that we created a schedule and a program of studies for them over their four years of, of high school. This would uh, be an example of a STEM student. So you'll see that in the red, we have the humanities courses. The blue is the art discovery that fulfills their arts requirement. This student is particularly into the arts, so isn't taking any more classes in the arts. And then that black Spanish too fulfills that one credit requirement. So I think that the question was just one credit for many years, there was no language, world language requirement, and kids still took three or four years of world language. Um, our current kids have a credit requirement, so they have one credit. This has not changed from the state, so they still have a one credit requirement for world language. Most of our kids will take more than that. You'll see in the green that those are the STEM courses. And so you'll have STEM, and then it's actually broken up with a PE Health. Those titles will be changing most likely for those courses, um, but the PE Health and then some other STEM classes down at the bottom. So you'll also notice that within that STEM program, the science classes, the AP Bio, AP Chem, AP Physics are each worth two credits. That takes up two periods in the student's schedule. And the student also was double booking in math class their senior year. They're going to take an ECE stats class as well as a AP Calculus class. So this is your heavily STEM focused kid that may avoid the arts like the plague, but really is focusing on the STEM requirements. The next student example that we have is a humanities focused student. When we look at this, you can see that the humanities again are in red. Um, the world language is in black requirement, and then those other world languages fulfill the more humanities electives. This student also happens to be a band kid, so there's some more arts classes there. Um, and then they have their science classes, and they have their other STEM electives, and their PE health requirements. Again, this is gonna be a student that might actually double book. If you look that senior year, we do have two ECE English classes, which are UConn credit courses. That student may take two English classes their senior year. They may take more in the social studies in the English than in the STEM courses as elective type classes. When we move on to the arts focus, 
you can see that, again, this student is going to be a student that is going to take all four years of art. They also happen to be a musician. They have their world language. They have their, their uh, STEM requirements, but if you look down and you look under the junior year, that last green course is music theory. Music theory, which most people might think is an arts class, can actually fulfill a STEM requirement. Digital imaging and DMD, they're both photography courses. Those can fulfill STEM requirements for the artistically minded student. So that's where we have sat down and categorized courses that can count in one category or another category, but not double dip for, for a graduation requirement. So this helps the students understand and helps, I think, hope, hopefully you'll understand a little bit more about how we can break things up for students and let them see and the different options they have. Again, with the flexibility, students may come to us and go, I'm gonna be a plumber. And we'll say, okay, you're still gonna take these courses to help prepare you for the direction that you wanna take. There's math and plumbing. You're not gonna avoid trying to take regular math classes, especially geometry, especially algebra. But we have some flexibility with some of the courses. And also, our job as a school counselor is to help make sure they keep doors open for them throughout their high school education because a lot of kids will come in and go, I wanna be a plumber. I'm gonna be an architect, same kid. I'm gonna be an artist. I'm gonna be a doctor. I'm, the career of the week. So we want that flexibility for them. We want them to understand that they're, they have many pathways they can work towards to achieve their graduation requirements. Okay? And I think that Ms. Yesko is up now. Good evening, Terry Yesko, Assistant Principal. Um, as the former English teacher, I get to talk to you about data. Um, I'm not sure quite how that quite happened, but um, here we are. So we've just looked at the past two years just for um, a quick snapshot of data. And I think that you'll see that we're really on the right track for 25 credits. Um, these two classes, again, were required to have 22.5. And we're looking at, for 2019, 88% of those kids already got 25 credits. The year before that, it was 86. So our students are, are overachievers in that sense, and our schedule is set up for that. Um, so out of a two-day uh, uh, course rotation, they have four periods a day. If they take six out of eight classes, they're already at 24 credits. Add in the credit for the mastery-based assessment, they've already got it, okay? They've met those requirements. So we're definitely on the right track to meet those 25 credits for our students. Mr. Moore? Thank you. You can see the uh, uh, future implications. Uh, tomorrow night we have a uh, PTSA meeting for the high school. I will be introducing uh, some of this information and, and answering questions, gathering feedback uh, along uh, with helping them understand what the implications are. Uh, you can see that we really have a challenge in front of us in trying to figure out what we're going to do with that mastery-based uh, credit. And so there are a number of ideas that we have, and so we just have to uh, figure out how exactly we're going to uh, to do that. Certainly there are potential budget implications uh, that go along with um, offering more credit because <coughs> next year it's freshmen and sophomores that need 25 credits. The year after it's three classes, the next year it's four classes, so incrementally it just uh, moves, moves forward. Um, uh, our two assistant principals, uh, um, Ms. Yusko and Mr. Webb, work on scheduling increasingly difficult to shoehorn the number of students into classes that they need in order to satisfy the, the requirements. So that certainly is, a, is a, a challenge, right? So really I'm, I'm going to leave you with uh, the idea that if you uh, vote to put this into policy, uh, this will give Wethersfield High School the flexibility to personalize schedules. Uh, but at the same time, we really do need those resources to operationalize what it is that we're, we're going to do, right? And with that, if there are any questions or comments, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to answer. Any questions? Ms. Granato. Um, I like the word flexibility. I was a little nervous when I read this the past few days on the arts, the humanities, and STEM, that if you started down one path, that it would be difficult to change because we've seen in the Career Advisory Board that these young people don't have any decisions made on their careers. So they do have the flexibility to change without losing the credits that are required for them Absolutely. to Absolutely, right. Perfect. Part of the design. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Cassio. Yeah, the question I have, I think Tara, you answered it for me <coughs> regarding your uh, statistics. And I, my question was, is Weathersfield ready for this? Weathersfield High School ready for this? And it sounds like 
we're halfway there or more than halfway there? We're partially ready for it. A little bit further, okay. And so it's tangible for a student over four years to achieve the 25 credit. It's the norm, quite honestly, yes, at this yes. point in time, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to put that out there because I know people are going to hear and go, oh my God, we're not going to get it, but we're already doing it. As you can see with the statistics, mm -hmm. uh, yes. And are, um, Cindy, is your department comfortable with your scenario, your layout of what we've done? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, we are, well, that's, I guess, flexible is our middle name in our department anyway, so we always are flexible. Uh, so, no, I think that our, our people, I've been meeting with the department, Jen, and I've been talking with, this, with our other counselors and how we're going to look at this. Um, the distribution of the credits and that flexibility and having many different options to help the kids achieve those requirements is fantastic for us. Um, it actually makes our credit accounting a bit easier in a lot of ways uh, because sometimes we're looking at going through and going, uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to get this kid into this class because they didn't take it or one of the things that the implications I think that we probably should discuss is whether or not we have enough of the electives for the kids. So I think that the STEM area will be challenging for us as time goes by because we're going from eight credits in STEM to nine credits in STEM um, requirement. And though we have other options like psychology, economics, some business classes to count as STEM, the seats available in those chair, in those classes are very limited. Um, so we are looking at that challenge now. I mean, part of me goes, I was going to say this to Mr. Moore earlier, I, I get a little bit of a cold sweat when I think of new registrations because I don't know what I'm going to put them in. I can usually get them into the core ca classes. I think that we're okay with those. Um, but the elective classes, as we look at trying to move schedules or try to look at change schedules for second semester, very, very limited seats, mm -hmm. if there are any seats. Most of our electives are very full. Now, the next question is, uh, I guess you or Tom, um, we attempted to do additional instructors for different courses in the past, but they didn't make the budget. Are you looking down the road for this particular budget that's approaching on Saturday? Yes, yeah, so we've had uh, numerous discussions about this. Quite honestly, our first priority isn't something that would affect graduation requirements, uh, but due to the burgeoning nature of our special education population moving mm -hmm. from uh, the middle school to the high school, and given the fact that, that we did have a cut in that area last year, probably the number one priority would be for an additional special education teacher. Beyond that, dealing with graduation re requirements, uh, our first priority probably would be a technology education teacher for a number of reasons. One uh, is that it would open up a number of seats that would satisfy a STEM requirement. Also, we have the room to do so. Um, our most requested <coughs> elective, quite honestly, uh, would be a, a STEM requirement is, is food and nutrition. Uh, we had over 400 requests for that last year, but we only have one kitchen, mm -hmm. right? So uh, again, we have some, some constraints in that area. So uh, if indeed I had to prioritize, it would be special education first, it would be uh, technology education second, and then probably art third, because I think I can, uh, again, with my economics degree, uh, I'm looking at the idea of getting 250 seats for 1.0 FTE and art, which really could uh, ease the difficulty in scheduling for, uh, for everyone. Thank you. And then my, uh, just a comment, Tara and Tyler, it's great to meet you. I've never met you before. I wouldn't know who you were, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Lesser. Thank, thank you, Chuck, and I've had the pleasure of sitting through this three times, and it's <laughs> better each time, so, uh, so thank you for all the hard, hard work for that. And I did make the comment at one of the presentations that a few years ago we talked about kids, students having a minor or having a special focus, like you have a college minor, and I really like that this plan has that flexibility to built in where they can have a minor. So along those lines, has this been at all socialized with how colleges might look at this type of um, student plan, the student credit? I know we're doing this to comply with the state uh, new, new mandates, but in terms of how colleges might look at our STEM focus or how colleges might look at our humanities focus or almost like having a minor. So it always, the answer is it always depends on the college. Uh, it depends on the major that the student wants to get into. So if I'm going to go into a engineering degree, but I have a mother load of humanities classes, the colleges will scratch their head and go, why'd you do that? Okay. That has always been that way. 
So what we will advise the students is to take the appropriate classes and the classes that colleges are typically looking for and you know, to answer the question, well, what do I need to do to get into Tufts? Well, donate your left kidney. <laughs> and um, you need to take the, push yourself into your, the hardest classes you can take and take four years of everything. And depending on your major, then take a little bit more within that different area um, because some schools are just, that's what they're like. If I want to get into uh, Western New England and I'm undecided and I don't know what I want to major in, then that's where that focus on what courses I've preferred can help that student a little bit more because it helps develop the passion. It helps them find and potentially develop a passion that they have that flexibility. And we always encourage kids, you know, take marketing, take business classes, take some of the technology education to classes. Even if, you, if your you know, focus is going to be in marching band. I was the big band weenie when I was in high school. <laughs> um, I didn't take all those other classes and I wasn't forced to, but I wonder now what my life, what direction I would have taken, not that I'm in the wrong path, <laughs> but what direction I might have taken if I had other opportunities that I've, I availed myself of in high school. So the idea is again, to approach it with an open mind, yet at the same time, most of our students are gonna be planning for that college admissions process and that the importance is gonna be taking your core courses, taking your US history as it stands right now for social studies, civics is the only course prescribed by the state. But we will still have kids taking international studies, US history, the core courses that we want them to take to help keep those doors open for college. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from the board? Geography, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Michaels. Oh, sorry. Just a quick question. Um, when the state said 20, and we decided to go with 22.5, was that sort of a, we believe we can do better? And if, if that is the case, do we feel that now that we're at 25, shortly down the road, we may say we can do better, and that number will go up again? Uh, to answer the first part of the, the question, uh, 20 years ago it was 22.5, although the state right had it as 20. I do believe that that was Weathersfield saying, yes, we can do a little bit better. We should offer a little bit more. We should require a little bit more of our students. So I, I do believe uh, that that uh, should be answered in the in the affirmative. Uh, moving down down the road, uh, again, I, I think we really do have to just look at our constraints. We have to look at what we can do. Uh, I think what we can um, think a little bit about is requiring more of the students, maybe not necessarily in terms of credit attainment, but maybe in terms of some of those other areas as identified in the vision of the graduate, uh, maybe some other areas identified in that third part of our school improvement plan, the civic portion, I think, and maybe some areas that might not be quantified through credit, uh, but really make a difference in people's lives, in the community's uh, lives, uh, some things that have a little more relevance for students, so I, I think we can do probably better in that area. Ms. Paradise. I just wanted to say, once I was with you guys on this committee, and I have never seen such a more professional group, hardworking people, doing the best for our children, and I wanna thank you. Well, thank you, we appreciate that. Thank you everyone for coming out and spending the evening with us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone. All right, moving on to announcements and information. Board members, please look at your packet. Make sure you know when your committees are meeting, and if you can't attend, please tell the chair of the committee or Mr. Emmett. Um, meetings held, community public relations. Ms. Evans is not here. Would anyone like to report out? All right, I do know they went over the new website. Oh, I'll, you know. I'll be happy to report out. Yeah, we had a, a presentation by our IT team when we talked about the uh, current state of our website and um, one of the things we've done over the past couple of years is we have uh, eliminated our reliance on a third party vendor with regard to our website and we've actually built it through Google Sites and we were able to build it in house. Um, so that represents a savings for the Board of Education of $22,500 a year. Uh, in addition to that, um, Sarah Harris, Jeff Telke, and Dave Moore, who serves as our webmaster, he's on our IT team, went through a series of analytics, um, so they are able to identify what um, areas of the website are being visited the most, and they can make strategic uh, decisions as to what to put on the main page. Uh, for example, one of the things they found was on the side, when you had the menu on the side, for those of us who are mobile users, that got blocked out. So they are switching that and moving it up to the top of the page. 
Um, they are going to be getting additional feedback. One of the things that they did, again, keeping with Leader Leader, Sarah went over to the high school and did a uh, lesson with the marketing students and actually had the marketing students beat the website up and talk about what was good with it and what needed to be improved. So we did that with our committee members last week, and I know that uh, Sarah is going to be meeting with members of the WSPC uh, at the next WSPC meeting to talk about uh, feedback from them as well. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Memorial Day Parade, Mr. Cassio. Thank you, Chuck. Um, we met last Wednesday, January 8th, at the town hall. We've got some exciting things going on. Uh, Sal Kusha has retired, and Mary Tebow has been taking over the assistant parks and rec director. So I think that in itself is uh, a change for the group, but the parade is uh, well underway. Uh, we're hopeful that the uh, budget for 2020 will remain the same, uh, which is from the town side, and it's a $5,000 uh, allotment for the uh, parade to continue. Uh, we're working on a theme and a parade marshal, as well as uh, the speaker. Um, you'll be receiving invitations in the mail, uh, and uh, we're ready to go. We're going to be doing the essay contest at the middle school again, as well as the poster uh, recognition <laughs> at the elementary school. So we had some discussion. I felt that it was important to see if we are looking for uh, to recruit new members of this committee. Um, and one idea and thought was to go to the high school to see if anyone from the high school would like to be a part of this committee since we have the elementary doing the uh, posters, the middle school doing the essay. We thought maybe a couple of students from the high school would like to be a part of the uh, Memorial Day Parade Committee Excellent. just to reach out to them to make sure it's, it's all part. Also <coughs> to get them involved on a town level to uh, understand what the parade is about. So I think we're just trying to uh, motivate and get community members. We're looking for uh, individuals uh, that would love to be a part of the parade. Um, and it's a, a very respectful event. So that's what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Cassio. Special Board of Education meeting on 110 was a student matter. The Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative on the 13th, Miss Granado. Okay, well, Michael and I attended WEC yesterday, and WEC is Weathersfield's Early Childhood Collaborative, and their vision is that all Weathersfield children, birth to eight, are healthy, developmentally successful learners and connected to the community. WEC right now is seeking new members for their steering committee and for a co chair position. Also, PEP which is People Empowering People, is starting on January 23rd for 10 weeks at the Pitkin Center. PEP is an innovative parent leadership program coordinated through UConn. For more information on that, please contact Kim Bobbin. Also, WEC is working to implement the United Way grant and is now recruiting community messengers. This group is also looking to create professional development for preschool teachers which will allow important communication between preschool teachers and our kindergarten teachers. And finally, over 30 preschool scholarships were awarded this year. The scholarships were made possible by the contributions from the Mayor's Ball. And this, again, is a great group to work with as we build a strong early school foundation. Thank you. And policy and planning, which was tonight, Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we had the Policy and Planning Committee meeting just before this. We got an opportunity to have a preview of the presentation that we just had. And as I said before, it keeps getting better and better. That was the main uh, item on the agenda. We did have another item, which was a recommendation to change the name of, and I don't want to say it wrong, so I'm going to read it, the Finance and Information Management Committee. Uh, Mr. Michaels, uh, to my right here, has recommended changing that to the Finance and Operations Committee which is a committee he chaired, um, to be more consistent with what the committee actually does. So those were the two things discussed in the policy and planning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. All right, there's meetings scheduled. We have a lot of meetings coming up. We are in full swing. Uh, don't forget this Saturday, 9 to 12, we have our special meeting for the budget workshop. There's no unfinished business. Public comment, you have 
Five minutes, please come to the podium, state your name and address. Anyone wishing to make public comment, now is the time. Seeing no public comment, we will move on to board comment. Any board members have comment at this time? Yes, Ms. Paradise. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure um, the vice chair should maybe know this. In, in recommending a um, policy committee change of title, I think we need to have a motion for all nine of us to vote on that. That will Would come. That be correct? Yes, that is correct, and that'll come at the next regularly scheduled okay. meeting. Yes. Thank you. Yep. And <clears throat> my next thing is, I'd like to request, oh, maybe in, in our Friday update, that we get um, an update. We're over halfway through the year on how the teachers feel about the assessment calendar changes we made last year. Do they feel <coughs> they're getting more instructional time? <coughs> Do they find these tests are um, providing them the information they need? And uh, are there more tests they need, or do they want to eliminate more? So I would like some kind of update on the uh, assessment calendar changes we made last year. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two things. One, I attended the web uh, PTO meeting in December, and the biggest part of, with, with you, Chuck, uh, the biggest part of the discussion was on the principal search, and they were very pleased that how um, the superintendent and the administration has taken a lot of their recommendations and consideration, things moving along well there. And the last thing I have is that we have the next career advisory board meeting uh, coming up Monday, uh, January 27th, and would love to see as many board members and anybody from the public to talk about um, how we're getting our students career and college ready. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Ms. Granato. Um, and I made sure that Deb Murphy is putting those, um, that in the foundations um, meeting on the calendar, okay? But I do have a comment on Keen on Kids, their after school enrichment program, which I do attend their meetings and they have a meeting coming up next week and we had a meeting at the end of De December before our break. Um, they continued to have a full array of winter and spring offerings coming up. Um, as you know, Keen on Kids is our after school enrichment program. Their vision is to consistently provide a variety of after school enrichment programs at all Weatherfield Elementary schools in a safe and fun environment in which all children can participate in athletic, academic, and social programs with the support and guidance of caring adults. And they are um, the payers of all of this. A few choices I wanted to mention. Um, Charles Wright is doing Susical, the musical. There's Mad Science Junior Chemist, Chess Clubs, Running Clubs, Magic Illusions, Fashion Design, Photography Journeys, and Building Up to Steam, to name just a few of the offerings. Um, so parents, please sign up. They do go fast. Um, Caroline Facina is always looking to find what are the um, barriers to students getting into these. So please keep in contact with Park and Rec and with Caroline Facino. And again, Keenan Kids is an incredible group, um, and this is an incredible addition to our schools. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Emmett, I know you have Isaac's I, update. I do. I do. Um, thank you, Mr. Carey. Um, Isaac could not be with us this evening. He is the manager of the Weathersfield High School girls basketball team, and they had a uh, game this evening, so he is attending to that. So uh, he asked uh, if I could just remind everyone that uh, Weathersfield High School students are currently in preparation for midterm exams that are coming up um, in the very near future at the end of this month. Um, he reports that students are starting to hear about uh, acceptances into colleges and universities. Uh, that is a very exciting time, a little bit of anxiety inducing time mm -hmm. as well for our students. But um, students, when they get the notification of where they're headed, they go into the uh, guidance office and they write it up on the wall. So it's great to visit the guidance suite and see where our uh, students are heading. He does report also we have some students that have met graduation requirements already and actually are graduating early, um, as you may recall last year. We had a young man who graduated in uh, January, immediately went into the Marine Corps and graduated from basic the same night we had our graduation. So we had a supplemental graduation for him at Webb um, at the conclusion of the last school year. Um, in terms of winter sports, Isaac reports that we've got girls and boys basketball. A girls team is actually ranked in the state currently. Uh, indoor track, uh, we just had the indoor track team set a record uh, that had stood for quite a while over the last weekend. 
Um, we have boys swim, we have gymnastics, and our hockey program is currently ranked uh, number two in Division Two with an eight and zero record. Isaac reports that um, we had two of our high school football players, uh, Jake Whitaker and Connor Pace, were selected to the All-State team. Uh, Weathersfield as a whole was granted a sportsmanship award by CAAC. And uh, Isaac also reports, uh, as you heard tonight, <laughs> that teachers are preparing for NEASC accreditation. So that's Isaac's comments tonight. Thank you. Any further comments? So um, I've been out and about in I went to the uh, Emerson PTO meeting last week and they were very excited that we have the music room recarpeted and their music teacher is back in the room. So the PTO was excited. Also at the PTO there was a presentation from the uh, EL teacher and I learned that their EL population went up from 47 students to 62 students in one year. So there's a huge EL population. <laughs> so you saw in your packet I had Mrs. Destoli include information about the EL population and you saw that Three of our schools this year are considered bilingual schools, and we're moving up to five of them next year, including Highcrest and Weathersfield <laughs> High School. So I found that information very informative. Um, also, um, boys basketball had some exciting games over vacation. I got to a couple of them. They lost a heartbreaker to innovation in overtime at home. The girls basketball team won a great game against Middletown. And hockey last Saturday had their alumni night. So after their team beat, um, Cheshire to nothing. There was about 40 alumni on the ice, ranging from, I believe, the class of 1975, Mr. DeRocher, I believe is 75, to the class of last year, 2019. So, and I believe about 98% of them were all under the current coach. So, as Mr. Emmett said, they are 8 0, they're ranked number five in the state overall. They're off to a great start, as well as the girls' basketball team. Seeing no other comments, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes.